Managing Director of Paragon Trust Company and tax and private client practitioner, joins us to bring a common sense approach to money in a world of total insanity. Let's welcome Tony D'Angelo. All right, our good pal Tony D'Angelo joining us, as he has been regularly for uh, quite a while here on Tuesday mornings. Tony, how are you, sir? I am fine, and uh, good morning to everyone. And thank you very much for uh, making your way out here last week. I cleaned the studio since you left, so it looks, <laughs> looks much better. I, uh, I thought it was a really neat place. I was happy to be there. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk, uh, at least in the beginning here, about gifted programs, right? Well, yeah, and this kind of speaks to the whole uh, condition of education in this country. Uh, and it has a lot of local ramifications. Uh, Seattle, Washington, you know, home of Amazon and Microsoft, High achievers go there. The average wage in the tech industry is $270,000 a year. And, of course, this is because they have no state income tax. You know, newsflash, bright people come there. Well, the superintendent of schools in Seattle, her name is Denise Juneau, she wants to kill the gifted program. And the reason why she wants to kill the gifted program, because there's too many white students. And the people screaming the loudest with this mess are the students in this program of color because it's like, hey, what about us? We want to achieve, and you're not take, you're taking this thing away from us. Well, this is the new thing in education. When people are doing well, it'll all of a sudden become some sort of a you know a fairness issue or a race issue. Let's go across the country. New York City, Bill Big Bird de Blasio, uh, one of my favorite politicians to curse out. Hmm. Um, there's really good high schools in New York City. I know because these were my teachers when I was uh, a school kid in Stanford. They had come from these places. They had moved to Stanford, and they would always tell us that you couldn't hack the mustard in these places. Brooklyn Latin, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science. He wants to remove the entrance exam because it's um, we have too many things going here to the gifted. We, uh, we've got to democratize this thing. Now ask yourself something. We're now in a period of coronavirus. Um, the president, you know, I believe is doing his best to get the best minds together. Um, how do you have a breeding uh, place for the best minds if you don't uh, have a place for them? And it's the kind of thing that uh, if you were, uh, whenever you're in a mess, you know, whatever the mess is, and we all get into messes, we want the best possible people helping. And if we're not having an environment to do this, um, where do we get them from? And, you know, we're saving, uh, you know, humanity uh, for, for the sake of mediocrity. Okay, let's bring that over to Connecticut. Now, Connecticut really in education is a, is a, is a hodgepodge, zooey mess. I can't really get my finger on it. There's no real, you know, quote, unquote, there's a couple of lip service things of we have to establish something for the gifted, but nothing really, you know, no real driving force. One thing becomes very clear, and, and ask yourself this, Lee. Um, the uh, city of Houston has 600,000 uh, students in their um, high school program. How many do you think Connecticut has? You think it's more or less? It's the less. State. It's a lot less. It's a lot less. And... We have 160 superintendents, all making over $100,000 a year. Mm. And you know how many superintendents Houston has? One. You know, so it's like, <laughs> you know, it starts to become obvious after a while. Now, I, I know you got a ton of questions, but I'm just going to sort of slide this in between the cracks. Sitting on the education committee of our lovely legislature is our friend Mae Flexer. Mm. Now, we have her actually, you know, J.R. Romano came on yesterday and, and very well put out the fact that uh, she was involved in some sort of, uh, or, or is involved in, and really, which is a pay-to-play thing, uh, you pay my charity and I'll, I'll put you before the people that matter, uh, which could really get into something a whole lot worse if she's using influence the other way. Uh, you know, I'll cause harm to you if you don't do it. There's no accusation of that, let's be clear. But it's the kind of thing that there's a standard in politics, which is you are supposed to represent your public. Ask yourself how all this represents the public. And the charity, curiously enough, that she's you know working with this Emerge America, Emerge Connecticut, go to their website, put in school choice. You'll get 
entry after entry after entry. We're opposed to it. We're opposed to it. We're opposed to it. So I'm just, I know you got a ton of questions and comments. I'm just going to leave you with this. There's not a whole lot you can get your hands on here because it's hard to get into who are the donors of a charitable organization. But dollars flow into the Connecticut educational system. Mayflex, or, uh, or, or, or the, uh, the legislature, shall we say. Mayflexer is sitting on the committee, and we have the wonderful educational mess we do. We are ranked 44th mm-hmm. in the World Population Review in success in secondary high schools. And look at what they have in Seattle. <sighs> You're at bat. Well, let me ask you about the, go back to the gifted programs, because what is it that Seattle wants to do? What would be the optimum number of folks of color as uh, being participants in these kinds of, of programs. I mean, is it half? Is it 25%? I mean, they haven't been clear about that. They just said dismantle it. It's unfair. And interestingly enough, there was a group that went to the courts in Seattle and said, you got to get rid of this thing. The judge will have to out of the ballpark. It's like, you know, since any kid could get in here and do this, why is this unfair? See, this is what always bothers me about when they you know, try to give you these uh, ultimatums as far as the, the color of folks who are taking part in certain programs. If, if it's not like ridiculously under what the normal levels of the population are and you don't see like rampant racism behind it, I, it just it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, 15 percent of the population is black, so there should be 15 percent of the folks in the gifted program. If there's a little bit less, we can accept it. If there's a, a, a more, that's great, because I guess maybe there are some smart kids in that school and you know, sort of it, it's it's like cyclical but it's it's this overbearing need to be politically correct at all times uh tony that kills us man well and you see it kills me on the other end because anybody who's in an elected office and i mean yeah may flexer you know jr covered that very well yesterday but it's there is no clear uh, shall we say, conflict policy in Connecticut. We've had double-jointed legislatures, be you Democrat, Republican, Martian, forever, because it's just, uh, it's been too convenient to, you know, sort of put your interest in. And then uh, when it comes to something like that, it's like, oh, yeah, this is something we're going to do in the grounds of fairness. It, it, it's a mess. And one thing I saw yesterday that gave me hope, I don't think I'll live long enough to see it in this state, Stanley Black and Decker in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and I challenge people in schools, call me up, you know, because I would love to do this. I don't think there, there really is the courage or the fortitude. Stanley Black and Decker is saying, give me your kids. I will pay them a salary to work for us in an internship, and they'll work right along with us, and they'll learn from our people. And when they get out, they'll have real-world experience, mm. you know, peer-to-peer, mentor-to-student. Now, of course, what happens then is, what are you going to do with everybody in education that you can't do anything else with? But for the fact that they're in education, that's not all educators, but you know, unfortunately, it's too many of them. You know, I used, I, I used to, I still talk to him almost uh, daily, but uh, one of my very good friends, he's older, about 20, 25 years older than me, he used to teach the gifted program over at New London High School. And, uh, he, you know, he always has this same sort of thought process that people, in a general sense, just don't like folks who are smarter than them. They just don't like being, uh, I, I don't know if it's an insecurity scenario or whatever, but he felt that, you know, he's teaching these kids who are in some cases brilliant, and they were either always picked on or uh, always on the outside looking in. I mean, I'm sure today those those same kids are, you know, business leaders and, and fi- they're fine, but at the time it's looked on differently. And I think that goes for everybody. I think people are, are intimidated by people who are very smart, don't you think? Well, yeah, I mean, there is a crab mentality. And when you get into the whole thing of, you know, racial fairness, um, I always tell the story of Marva Collins. Go to anybody in education today and ask them who Marva Collins is. They probably can't tell you. This was a single black lady in Chicago who saw what was happening to children of color in that school. And she started her own, and she worked, and she drilled, and she taught these kids finance, commodities, engineering she brought people in on a shoestring and she's passed on i think the past three or four years but all these kids now who are in their 40s uh you know black ghetto kids from chicago they're all in positions of leadership you know people don't tell me it can't happen you just got to get the right people there leading kids and telling them what to do tony great stuff as always we'll chat next week thank you
Thank you. All right, buddy. Have a good one, Tony D'Angelo. Pleasure to chat with him on a regular basis. All right, we'll take a quick break. His partner, Bob.